Hey, welcome back to the Money Healing Podcast. I'm your host, Nadine Zomelt, coming at you at the very beginning of this episode with a quick disclaimer. Today's episode is pretty epic. It is gritty, it is raw, and it's very, very real. My guests and I do discuss themes of trauma, abuse, mental illness, and drug addiction, and the usual sprinkle of profanities. Don't worry, we don't go too deep or into much detail, but it could be a lot, especially if uh, you don't have a lot of emotional capacity right now, or if these themes usually upset you. So please, if you need to skip ahead, go ahead, that's okay. Um, There's plenty of other um, topics on this podcast that might be more appropriate for you. However, if you're still interested, um, you know, I hope you enjoy this episode, but do know that you can take breathers if you need to, see how your body is feeling as you are going through this episode, pause it and come back to it later on. So with all that in mind, I hope you enjoy it. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Money Healing Podcast. I'm your host, Nadine Zomalt. I am a holistic money coach and a somatic practitioner. And today we are just riding the wave of the theme, healing through joy and healing through art. And with me today is my friend and colleague, James Kerr. And James is, uh, I would say he's the most, I mean, I've had a lot of talented people on my podcast, but he's the most multi-faceted, multi-talented person so far. So James is, well, a father. He's also a tattoo artist and he is a musician in a really kick-ass band called Greybush. If you like metal, definitely check them out. I'll put the um, link in the show notes. And what else? What else do you do, James? Tattoo artist, dad, what yeah, else? Yeah, uh, husband, uh-huh. father. Um, Is it father uh, and dad the same thing? Yeah. Fa- I'm a fa- <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dad when he likes me. I'm father when he doesn't, oh, right? Oh, father. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, Are you daddy formal. at any yeah. point? <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I used to be when he was real young. But oh, no, okay. No, not anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just gonna say welcome welcome to the money thank healing you. podcast James I'm so happy <laughs> you're you. here we're like both huh? so giddy and so excited yeah. to be here and I know that everyone is gonna love you and hey. James and I uh we met in um my friend Ryan Roy's group so Ryan Roy he was featured on this podcast um maybe a year ago and Ryan and I met four years ago and he's my best friend forever. He runs a financial coaching co- uh, company for tattoo artists. James was actually in that group and James has a yeah. beautiful way of talking about his trauma. He has just a beautiful way of expressing himself and we clicked and I've coached James and he's a great person. Um, and that's how we met. So tell us a little bit about you and before we dive into the juicy stuff. Yeah, uh, dude, thank you. I'm so glad and honored to be here. It's pretty, pretty, pretty amazing. Are we allowed to cuss? Can we cuss? Absolutely. Yes. yes. Good, good. Because my nephew calls me Uncle Cussy because I have a problem not cussing around him. <laughs> He's like 10 or something. I don't know, so. <laughs> Uncle Cussy. Well, you yeah, should have put that on your thing. That's, I, I forgot. Damn. I can't. <laughs> I got so many Uncle, roles I play. Uncle like, Cussy. That's <laughs> <yeah>. so cute. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah I, i've been tattooing for uh shit in, in may it'll be 19 years and, you're like uh, 77 uh, or something yeah, <laughs> I mean, <he's> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you see james yeah. face i mean yeah. he looks yeah. like a 30 year old when he told me he yeah. was 50 i was like, like what <laughs> <laughs> i know there was i had a friend of mine who's a bass player in one of my uh our brother bands in Sacramento, he told me, he, uh, you're, you look like a rough 35 year old. And I was like, I'll take it. He like uh, emphasized yeah, the rough, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I've been in a, a national touring band called gray bush for uh shit since we changed our name in 2020, right before the pandemic mm-hmm. hit. And that like stifled everything oh. for a while. And so we, um, basically just wrote an album and everything during our lockdown time before shows came back. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And you know, I grew up in a, a very 
tra traumatic environment um, and, you know, almost didn't survive it. And, uh, uh, but I did, and I'm here. You did, and I'm grateful and I, you're here. I'm healing. Yeah. I'm grateful I'm here too. Very much. Yeah. And I think, we're, we're I healing think, every day. Absolutely. It's a journey. There's, there's, it's, it's part of my activity, you know, and, and it's, and it's growing, you know, it's growth. I think healing and growth can be synonymous in, in this context, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I do have like kind of an outline for our conversation today. And one of those things okay. is kind of like getting your take on very important keywords. Like we're not going to get into it now, but one of the things is like, what is healing? What is safety? What is authentic mm. self-expression from your perspective? But, yeah. you know, like I, I do have, I do have an outline because James Correct. and I can go on many tangents. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> the other thing that we have in common is that both of us were saved by Alice in Chains. Yes. <laughs> when we were, oh my God. when we were teenagers, I mean, Alice in Chains. God bless Lane Staley, man. Really? Oh my God. I mean, yeah. without, yeah. Alice in Chains, I don't know how I would have survived my my yeah. household, honestly. Yeah. And there's some way that uh, since we weren't allowed to authentically self-express that, that mm -hmm. he was doing the job for us. Right? Until, oh, my God. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I was, was so stifled as, you yeah. know, I, I was born in the Middle East and very, very, very strict father and abusive as well. And authentic self-expression was out of the question. Like I had, I've always had short hair, but... There in the Middle East in the 90s, being a girl with short hair was the biggest no-no. And for me, it was the only way for me to express myself and just do something. I wanted short yeah. hair. And even the taxi drivers would be like, are you okay? Um, are you <laughs> sick? It, why is your hair short? I'm like, what the fuck? Dude? You just You're not I'm... a cancer patient, right? <laughs> it, like... <laughs> was just, it was so bad. And my dad would yeah. kick me out every time. I'd shave my head or like cut my hair short. I would just like <laughs> account for a few days out of the house because as soon as he sees me, I'll get a beating and then I'll get kicked out. That was, yeah. you know, me trying to self-express, right? Right. And I was a teenager. And to hear Lane just belt out his pain in such an incredible voice. And everybody, if you don't know, you really need to check out Alice in Chains with Lane Staley. Sorry, yeah. I'm not yeah. into the new guy. So no. Lane passed away and they just replaced him. And I, right. I can have a whole podcast episode about that. <laughs> I have a lot to say to Jerry. <laughs> hey, what are you doing? You were, you guys were done. Seriously. Then you weren't. <sighs> dude uh, yeah. so um tell us let's just like uh segue into everything through our common friend money 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 our bestie i love it, love it. yeah yeah so before you started working with ryan so you joined ryan's group as a tattoo mm -hmm. artist that wanted to get better at money tell us about what your financial situation was like before you joined and maybe give us a background on what your relationship with money has been like. Uh, that's a good, that's a good, let me take my watch off. It's distracting. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so my relationship with money was, uh, my situation was okay mm -hmm. before I took Ryan's course, but you know, I'm still kind of in what we call pirate mode in the tattoo industry and uh -huh. in, his, in his course, because a lot of tattooers come like, you know, the whole industry itself is like uh, traditionally an underground industry. You know, back in my grandfather's day, the only people I got tattooed were, were whores and sailors, blah, 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 you mm -hmm. know, like that kind of thing. But that that world is gone now. And now the tattoo industry in and of itself is it's one of the highest growing industries in the world. And it's like at 9% a year, the, the growth wow. rate. And it's super, that's super, that's big. That's massive. So that means that there's a lot of other tattoo artists in the business now. And, there, and, and, and there's a lot, uh, a lot of people saying, you know, the uh, tattoo industry is oversaturated with art artists. I wouldn't say that, and Ryan changed my mind about that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's it's saturated. Sure, there's more people, but that it's not oversaturated. So my my financial situation, um, you know, being in a metal band that's not signed and not making money, they, there was a very uh, big kind of like debt that I was accumulating mm -hmm. uh, uh, because of that. You know, trying to fund the band, like me and my buddy Jake were were the only financial. 
uh, uh, contributors to the, the, to the band. We did a lot of, mm-hmm. yeah, we're the band. I'm the band crazy uncle. <laughs> Uh, you know what I mean? So <laughs> uh, Jake was the band dad. He makes most of the decisions, but he always like talks to me about shit. Mm-hmm. Um, him and I have been playing music together for like 30 years. So okay. he's old too. That's why we're called Graybush. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so my, and then, tr- you know, my whole money mindset wasn't even a thing that I had, had any awareness about ec- except for the way money would make me feel inside. Mm-hmm. And money is a very emotional thing. Especially when, uh, like, for me, I grew up on welfare in a very, like, uh, low economic uh, place. I grew up on a, a Native American reservation here in Northern California called Hoopa, and it's named after the tribe. Um, and I'm not Native myself. But um, so growing up on welfare in that environment, you know, where it's, you know, the, you're living uh, with people who are, like, collectively at a genetic level dealing with uh, generational trauma in a, in a huge way. They're, yeah. You know, they had a population of, you know, tens of thousands of people, and now they're only down to like two, three thousand people. You know, mm-hmm. so that's that's very traumatic for a people as a whole, mm-hmm. and they're trying to hang on to their their heritage and trying to teach their children their heritage and all that kind of stuff. So, that, um, and and also on the on the other side of it, for me, I was raised religious as well. So the money was is the root of all evil. Yep. You know, um, only you know only people who are evil get rich, you mm-hmm. know, this whole thing that I was fed and, you know, these televangelists are stealing and robbing us and blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, anytime I wanted to do something, if it cost money, the answer was always no. And oh, everything yeah. costs money. High five. You, Same. Yeah. High five. Right. <laughs> so it, it really gave me this whole, why even try for anything? So my mindset essentially, uh, when I got to Ryan's course was, you know, my dad had just passed away and I realized that I'm kind of next in line not to be morbid or anything. I don't think death is a morbid thing, honestly. I think the more we talk about it, the less fear is around mm-hmm. it. But we're not we're not doing that right now. Um, Part four. Uh, huh? <laughs> Part four. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. That's a segue <laughs> into a whole other podcast. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so entering his, his course after my dad had just passed away, you know, both my parents are gone now. I'm feeling this kind of like sense of free freedom now that like I don't have to answer to anyone, Mm -hmm. which is kind of a a, like a positive symptom of losing your parents in a way. It's kind of weird to talk about it that way, but that's what I I'm gone I've gone through. Mm -hmm. And um, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. I mean, right. I don't. I haven't seen my dad in 20 years, and he's still alive and all that. And I don't wish ill on him. But I still feel his presence. And sometimes, you know, I I do feel like people say, oh, you got to tell the story on your podcast. I'm like, no, I, yeah. no, no. Yeah. Uh-uh. And I was the same way, especially in the online space. I'll mm-hmm. talk to you about it in person mm-hmm. uh, easily. I just started after I waited a year till my dad passed away, after my dad passed away, till I started talking about it in the online space. Yeah. Um, because I wanted to kind of give give myself that time to grieve and then process should I even be telling the story? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, so yeah, meeting, uh, getting into Ryan's class and he had doing some mindset stuff and realizing that there was even a part of me as an artist coming from the art artistic perspective that was blocking my mindset around money too, mm-hmm. which was, you know, I don't want to be a sellout. Mm-hmm, you mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm, real mm-hmm. artists don't make money. You got to be a starving artist, mm-hmm. you know, otherwise you're not a real artist air quotes, you know? Yep. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, there's like a threefold thing that I discovered in Ryan's course and working with him, working with you, um, uh, on, on that whole thing. And it's really changed my life and it's just continuing to do so. Yeah. I'm on this different path that I didn't think I would ever be on six months ago. Seriously. Yeah, really? Yeah. You didn't like, wow, that's, that's yeah. amazing. It's only been six months. Your transformation is incredible. Thank you. That's Thank so you. awesome. Um, did you connect the dots between your past childhood and money before you, we started having like the real money talks? No. No, I didn't even know money trauma was a thing. Huh. Yeah, I had no clue. And it, of, course it, of course it is. It makes so much sense. And it's all interconnected with my religious trauma and my... Uh, physical and psychological abuse I went through. Yeah, too. And it's emotional. All, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot there, but mm-hmm. um, wow, 
because you're so like in tune with your past. Like I, I, I do talk to a lot of people that maybe are avoidant of certain things and that is not like to shame. Sometimes right. we need to avoid certain things, right. avoid certain memories, avoid certain parts of us as a survival mechanism. Right. But you seem to have well integrated certain things. Am I wrong to say that? No, I think I, I, I had to do that to emotionally survive. Got like, it. Tell I, me more. Yeah. Um, uh, to be able to, well, I think it goes back to when, you know, uh, the first time my dad put a gun to my head, uh, was, I was in third grade mm -hmm. and I don't, you've, you've seen the video I put on my Instagram about yeah. that, like going to, in depth with that story. Uh, and it, you know, so that's when I really, really got the lesson that I am not allowed to authentically express myself or have feelings. Or have feelings, otherwise I would die. Like mm -hmm. that was a like it. That's basically what it meant, anyways. Like for, but that was an extreme like example in my memory of what of what that is. And so when I so okay, the 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 physical abuse uh, stopped when I was like 12, 13 years old. But by that time, I had done I had gotten into puberty, and I started using methamphetamines around the age of fourteen. Mm -hmm. And so um, that led me into the mental hospital. By the time I was 19, I got I collapsed on the sidewalk in in Eureka, uh, and I got revived by EMTs, and then put into the mental hospital for like two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was tied to a bed and everything mm -hmm. there. And then like so, I went through this whole cycle of going to the mental hospital, getting stuck there. And then kind of getting out of that and then being clean for a while, little while and then getting back on meth mm -hmm. and then going back to the nut house. There was a period of time in between in those four years when I was in that cycle where I was uh, permanently in the mental health system. I had gotten diagnosed with schizophrenia and uh, uh, chronic paranoia and, and schizophrenia. And at that time, it was like the mid-90s, like mm -hmm. early mid-90s. Mm -hmm. There was no diagnosis yet for amphetamine induced schizophrenia mm -hmm. which is what i ended up having mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um because i so i got out of that cycle and so what i ended up doing is i realized i met my wife at the time it's a crazy story too like she just came in divine intervention of some sort and she she i don't know i like to make fun of her and like say yeah you just went to the nut house and you said i'll take that one <laughs> you know that's so cute <laughs> yeah there's a fixer upper right there let's go for it Aww. and see what happens yeah you're um, still together has it been what yeah. like 70 years now <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. yeah totally we've been married for about seven thousand years <laughs> there you go yeah. maybe you have been yeah. on a soul to soul yeah. level on a soul knows, level, right? right? Absolutely. Like I when think, it clicks, <laughs> yeah, it clicked immediately. And that's the thing; they let me out on the caveat that I would uh, be moving in with her. Mm. And she was like, "Yeah, okay, yeah, well, we'll take him in." And wow. so I, we were only together for like two months at that time. Okay, and we've been together for about twenty-eight years now. Twenty, Aww, yeah, married that's a for like beautiful twenty-six. Story. I can't, I can't keep track. I hid from the world mm -hmm. with her. I realized that you know. Let's, I was like, let's experiment with not doing meth. How about that? <laughs> and so the the longer that I stayed off of it, the the, the quieter the voices and the hallucinations got mm. to the point where they were gone. And then wow. at, at that point when they when they realized they were gone, I got depressed because I felt disconnected from everything. So there mm -hmm. was a sense of connection in that kind of schizophrenic state that okay. I can't explain, but the like connectedness to everything in a way, but, um, uh, yeah, that was gone too. And so I had to find out, I had to figure out a way besides doing art and besides playing my guitar to be able to express myself. And then, so that was a challenge at first. And then, but that's kind of what I ended up, how I ended up starting to tell my story mm. because I needed to like reach out to people and make those connections with people and just be really who I am with people around me. And, uh, yeah. I, I, f I felt like, cause at that time I was doing some healing with my father too. Like he was finally like, thank God you quit doing meth here. Have it have, you know, I'd smoke weed with him and stuff too, yeah. because that was, that was crazy. The first time I ever smoked weed with him, it was like, I was a man now, you know, oh, he finally oh, yeah. accepts me <laughs> in some way, okay. you know? Mm -hmm. So there was that, that part too. Um, but How yeah. How old were you when that, when that connection like that, 
you know, nicer about, part of connection happened. They started happening around 22, the age 22, mm-hmm. 23. Yeah. 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 So, Did you feel safe hanging out with your dad? Not like no, not you completely. Didn't. There was yeah. there was no way I could ever feel completely safe hanging out with him. I and I know what you mean. Not possible. I yeah. have this thing when I hang out with my dad. My whole body feels like it's shivering. Yeah. Do you know? And that? that's a survival it's, response, right? Like the dog I, shiver after they get traumatized, right? I to didn't connect it. Off, it. Right? I haven't yeah. seen him in, in a long time, but I know, like, when he could come pick me up from somewhere, I'll, I'll be in close proximity with him, or be in the same room with him. My whole body is shivering, yeah. and I'm like cowering, and I'm like trying in protective mode. And it made when I started reading more about trauma and started getting like certified and, and, and understanding what was happening, it was such a revelation of like oh that's why yeah. you know like I was in fight or flight the whole time because like after right. hanging out with him for many hours my muscles of like my calf muscles and my arm muscles and my shoulder muscles get really like sore and right. I ask myself like what did I do I wasn't punching but I was so tense such in fight or flight mode with him and around him I'm just banging on my desk <laughs> sorry yeah. ah. that <laughs> that my, mu- my, mu- my body was actually reacting acting the whole time yeah gosh the body yeah. is so freaking smart it is i read yeah. something i can't remember where but like trauma survivors remember memories in body sensations or like oh something like that i i know i'm like botching up the the quote but i get it though that's right the, yeah your yeah, body really remembers these yeah. things no matter wow. what I, I, I used to ask people, does anxiety attacks count as cardio? <laughs> <Dude>. <laughs> like, right? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. I think if my heart's going, tune, 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 that's it's, cardio, you know, right? That's a heart rate, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we laugh about this stuff, but you know, yeah. we did not have happy or funny childhoods at all. No. No, no, at all. not at all. Yeah. Nope. So um, tell us a little bit about how you feel your past has impacted the your authentic self-expression as a multi, what do you call like multimedia artist? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Is it multimedia, yeah. multifaceted, yeah, so. multidimensional? Yeah. What multidimensional. Are, <laughs> what are you? Uh, I'm a multidimensional alien <laughs> being from... <laughs> Pleiades. Uh, play, yeah, exactly. The Pleiades star system. Cool. Uh, <laughs> I've, had, I've had aliens before on my podcast. Yeah. You're not the oh, first. <laughs> no, no. Good, good. Well, I didn't know that. that yeah. uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm but, a fan of aliens. I'm just saying. Oh, yeah, like same. I, I like the UFO stuff. I like, I like science fiction stuff, like all of it. I'm oh, you fan. and Tommy yeah. will sit yeah. down and have the best time. He just watches yeah. this stuff all the time. Yeah, and I'll watch it over again too. Yeah. Like oh, if I, there's nothing else, I go back to like aliens and ancient civilizations and oh yeah, my God. <laughs> yeah, and all that. Yeah, I told you all that we needed an outline because we yeah. would just go on yeah. tangents. <laughs> <laughs> on this episode of Ancient Aliens, like, <laughs> are we <Ancient> sponsored by? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you need more hair to say that, dude. Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> That's true. Necklace. I can grow it. I'll grow it and I'll get back to you. George Siklos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Tell what us. What was the question again? I don't know, dude. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was talking, I was asking and wondering what you thought um, the impact of unresolved trauma on our authentic self-expression oh. as multifaceted dimensional artists. Yeah. You, you I'm not that. Yeah. You, yeah. Right. Right. Um, well, the, the definitely it not being able to be authentically expressive, like say if I'm crying or if I'm or if I'm angry and I have to like stifle all that, mm-hmm. that energy like has to go somewhere. And I feel very lucky that I had a creative outlet for that, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, that's it, my artistic expression 
has come from, it was a survival response. It was, wow. it was my original emotional survival response. Oh my God. I love that yeah. you said that because people are like, why are you so intuitive? I'm like, that was my survival. Like that yeah. was how I had to survive. Yeah. You know, people always mention, even before I started coaching and all that stuff, my mom would always ask me questions because you have a sixth sense. My friends would yeah. ask me questions and you know, all that stuff. And, and later on, when I started working with clients, they're like, how did that develop for you that was only when i realized that it had to develop because yeah. i had to rely on something right yeah right? exactly yeah and i didn't discover music until i was 17 mm -hmm. and uh, the, my main motivation for getting into music was because i wanted to get laid mm -hmm. uh it didn't work so that was my original motivation uh but uh I ended, it ended up being an emotional, uh, a way to be able to express my authentic self. I could play my sadness. I could play my anger. And, you know, that's what led me into playing metal music was mm -hmm. I needed that kind of, uh, um, ability to express my anger in a safe way. Uh, partially because I'm a, I'm a, I was afraid of my own anger. Uh -huh. there's oh, a, a lot there's of people this, are. Yeah. I don't want to be like my dad. Mm -hmm. Right. That was my whole thing. And then his anger was violent dangerous and destructive and chaotic and wow, and yeah. and evil like i could see evil. the devil mm -hmm. in his eyes yeah it was evil and mm -hmm. i didn't want to be that but so that that um me drawing skulls and all this kind of stuff i i love that i um i still do i still tattoo skulls but now i just put everything in outer space because i love cosmic themes mm -hmm. and it's led me all of this stuff has led me down a spiritual path really and that's where i you know i, I you know, I, I think it's it's important to say that because um, that sense of connectedness that I had lost when I when the, the voices and everything went away, I didn't really lose. I just I just uh, lost my perception of it, but I I regained it naturally over time just by trying to figure out because the question re remains or remained in my head for a long time after I came back from that uh, was what the hell happened to me. How do I explain my experience to people, you know? Oh so, goodness. like, yeah, like, how do I, like, t how do I get people to relate to the fact that my cat would would talk to me and, and, and to have, I'd have a conversation with my cat and it would tell me it was fighting demons and shit, like, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I can, though. I can relate that to, um, it was basically an outer expression of an inner conversation of me fighting my own demons and mm -hmm. I was kind of projecting that's what our brains do. We project. We project, uh, yeah. Yeah, and we're yeah, so, meaning-making machines, you know. Yeah, exactly, and that's what schizophrenia, in a way, is its own language. You know, it's kind of a, like a subconscious language that uh, I think taps into the Jungian archetypes, in a way. You know, yeah, I don't, I don't, you, you know what Jungian archetypes are. We did like, archetypes you know. together. Huh, hello. Oh. <laughs> duh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Right. I remember you now. What's your name? <laughs> I'm the fool. <laughs> That's right. right. I, I forget what I am. I don't know. I, 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 I feel, you probably yeah. your archetypes, your money archetypes probably um evolved and I would yeah. be curious to we'll do that in Ryan's group this month. Okay. Yeah. Great, great. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that together. Yeah. So um, you were talking, you were saying about like voices and the connections and like how yeah. we're meaning making machines. And then you went to the Jungian archetypes. Yeah. And so there, there was this uh, example, like whenever I first got together with uh, my wife and, uh, you know, there was, it was a couple of weeks after we got together and I was like, all of a sudden I had this like vision that like, I saw like the the moon mm -hmm. like crashing, like the sun got really close to to us, and then the moon got really close to us, and it like kept going into the sun, and it blew up, and then it like destroyed the world. And I was like, oh my god, I got to break up my, with my wife, otherwise, or she wasn't my wife at the time. I got to break up with my girlfriend, otherwise, the sun's gonna burn burn up the moon, and all life on Earth's gonna be destroyed. And so I tell her this, and she was like okay <laughs> you know like mm -hmm. oh the sun's gonna burn up the moon okay well she respected it though you know she was always she'd always been able to do that somehow she i'd have some sort of delusional thing and she'd be just like agree with it and go with it with me but later on when i started studying and when i came back and i started studying a little bit of like psychology and learning about carl Jung and 
and that kind of thing. Like I realized that the sun is an archetype for masculine energy and the moon is an archetype for feminine energy. And by me it being, yeah, by me saying that uh, the sun was going to burn up the moon and all life was going to be destroyed, what I was saying was I was going to corrupt her and the whole relationship would have been just destroyed. So that's what, because I knew subconsciously that I wasn't, the, in the right frame of mind for her, that I wasn't good enough for her in a way, you know? That's basically what I was trying to say. So that's, that's what I mean when I say schizophrenia has its own kind of language, you know? Like, that if you can get to the, like, the meaning of the symbolism or whatever. And I think art, as far as, like, getting back to what you are asking about, like, authenticity and, and self, pure, true self-expression, I think symbolism is a great way to do that in a sneaky way. To where, like, you have your own meaning at- attached to these art, that you know, these objects uh, in your art, but other people may not see that. Part of like being able to authentically express myself had to, had to do with like symbolism, like coming up with my own archetypes in through my art, and in in, in a way, it's like a yeah, like a dream language, you know, like a code, so I could express myself and no one else w- would be able to understand what I was saying. You know, that's, that's incredible. And talking about like alchemy, right? Yeah, like yeah. alchemizing pain to art or pain to purpose or pain to beauty. Yeah, just this is exactly what you're describing here. And it's pretty fucking impressive. I, I love, love that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I want to circle back to something um, that you mentioned, but I want to kind of take it back a little bit further, like further back okay. and talk about connection, like talking yeah. about how important attachment is for, for us as, as babies, right. As infants <laughs> yeah. and what your, um, what your experience from your maybe personal life or from what you see with others is like the impact of this attachment on our relationship later on, and perhaps even our relationship with finances, our relationship with work and, and earning, you know, as you said, the starving artist archetype, Yeah, you right. know, so um, take us back to like the very beginning to Genesis. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, first the earth cooled and then the dinosaurs came. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so um, hmm, let me, let me think for a second. Uh can you reframe that qu- question? Of course, yeah. Yeah. So I want to kind of dig into connection. Connection. Right? The and importance how that relates of to- connection, especially the connection that we relate to on a nervous system level. The, mm. the, the a connection that begins with the attachment style, like the attachment wounding or secure attachment, and how you see that impacting art, money, and earning. Oh yeah, Making yeah. Money. Of course, of course. I I got you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So the attachment thing is, uh, as you know, I'm a fan of uh, Dr. Gabor Mate, and he really il- outlined um, mm-hmm. how our attachments are are basically life or death, especially when we're we're babies, yeah. right? And still, even to this day, yeah. that, that's how we subconsciously our nervous systems are wired for attachment, and we need that because it, it is life or death for us, you know. And so. Balancing that, I can say for myself as a tattoo artist, having to navigate, like, say, when I raise my prices, because I need to raise my prices for things more expensive. Now my mind goes immediately, well, if I raise my prices, then people aren't going to come to me and then I won't have anything. So there's that my whole, like, my need, what I need ought to be authentic Mm -hmm. versus my attachments that I think I need. Mm, mm-hmm. And I think I need them because in a way I do, because it's life or death, it's survival. It goes back to that. Um, and as an art, as art, uh, being an artist in general, not just in tattooing, pricing art is the hardest thing to do because now you're talking about your self-worth. So our connections, not just with each other is is in that, but it's also our connection with ourselves mm-hmm. that's in that. How much do I value myself in the time that I spent on this piece? You know, so a lot of times when I'm saying, when I'm trying to figure out what this piece of artwork is worth, I'm subconsciously asking myself, what am I worth? In right? a way, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't have pieces of art, but I do have like my six-month program and I – I often just say it took me 43 years to create this program. Like right. how the hell that's, am I going to price that? 
Right. Yeah. And that's priceless. Right. Um, and that's the other thing to consider is that not only are people paying for, for the tattoo I'm doing, they're paying for the experience that, that I've put into it. Mm-hmm. You know, the time that it took me to learn and the, the time I'm still putting in to learn it. Um, and the t- all the materials that that I that I pay for to buy the the space that I'm working in, um, all the jokes I've learned to tell all, <laughs> all over the years, yeah, <laughs> all the dad jokes, you know, I got all kinds of them, um, and and I but I and I think, you know, I I heard somewhere, and this is super true, like fifty percent of selling art is is people will buy art because the art is good and they'll buy the artist as well. So it's like 50% mm-hmm. good art, 50% the artist. I heard that right? yesterday on a podcast, but it was, um, I can't remember. A podcast is called There She Rose, I think. And she said, people buy you before they buy your things. Right. That's people true. buy into you before they buy your programs or something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that, once I realized that, that's what gave me a little bit more of a permission slip to like put myself out there on, on my Instagram, like authentically, well, this is who I am. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. then, and you know, that was scary because I was I bet worried. It is. Yeah. I was, I was worried that I'm going to lose my attachments to like certain pe- like people. Uh, uh, and like, especially like my mom's side of the family, you know, mm. Oh, my cousin did kind of reach out to me recently and, uh, say hey dude i love what you're doing and i was like oh i'm so glad you said that because i was worried i was going to piss you off by t- telling my story and he was like you know i don't know uh, you definitely didn't piss me off you know what i mean and that was so, such a like a validating reassuring thing so my attachment that i thought i was risking wasn't even a real thing wow as far as like you know um so there is this extreme court correlation especially when you're going through trauma at a, at, a, at any age really mm-hmm. of you know the battle between authenticity and and attachment and i think um both are necessary for our survival yes you know yeah because if oh we're God. inauthentic that can lead to all kinds of problems like for me uh, ptsd that's a diagnosis that i got that still sticks with me i still deal with, with that mm-hmm. to a, a very lower degree now because i've learned to regulate better um and uh um uh generalized anxiety disorder anxiety issues panic attacks those are all um um adaptations that i i did to survive the trauma growing up uh and you know that uh, ended up being personality traits that's basically how gabbert uh, yeah Mate puts i love it, that right? perspective right like yeah. our personality uh, traits our quirks they're yeah. all coping mechanisms and it's so yep. true i had to be the funny one yeah, same. You too. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. I had to be the clown when mm-hmm. my parents would fight and throw shit at each other. I'm in the yeah. room clapping and dancing so that my little brother won't, um, you know, hear them. He obviously were... heard them, but right. I was just trying to, you know, try. I'm trying. You're trying to lighten up the vibe, right? right? Yeah. And they're screaming and, I think and I'm clapping and dancing and singing. I mean, I had yeah. to be that. Yeah. Yeah. Same and everybody's like, my... oh, you're so extroverted. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> If you want. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> if you want. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. No, you're absolutely right. I was a protector for my little sister too, you know, as best I could. I couldn't protect her really, but I, you know, I would take the, uh, the, the, the brunt of my dad's anger first so she could deal with her, like her thing. Th- those things, like my sister and I are super like close. We're like war buddies, you know? Yeah. 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 It's really good. Trauma that bonded she, siblings, you know. Trauma bonded siblings. <laughs> yeah. I try to keep my my um, you know relationship with my brother non trauma oriented. Although yeah. I am really like, I'm proud of him because he's doing a lot of work on his own. When he comes to me to things, but I make it clear that sometimes we talk about this, but sometimes we really need to talk about the other side of trauma, which yeah. is the healing part, right? right. And and yeah. knowing that there's no such thing as like, okay, I'm healed now, goodbye. No, no, right. right. <laughs> you know, it's need to we need to be realistic, especially now that trauma talk is like the buzzword on on the in the online world, right? Yeah. And people claiming that you will heal, but what's your perspective on like okay i'm healed see ya 
Yeah. Well, how do you define healed? Mm -hmm. That would be my first question. Uh, If you define healed by you never have symptoms anymore, uh, then you're right. It's not real. You know, so Mm -hmm. for you got to lower your lower my for me. You don't have to do shit. I'm going to (laughs) say I words. (laughs) Use your Uh, I words. Yeah. Use my I words. (laughs) Jesus. Uh, uh, I I, I had to. uh, think of it that that healing is not a a destination; it's a process of evolution. Mm-hmm. You know, like for example, mm-hmm. when I was doing martial arts, I was a martial arts teacher for about six years, and my teacher, uh, in that he's the one that owned the dojo. Uh, he, when my mom died, this is this is this is pretty epic. I had a harder time dealing with my mom's death than I did with my dad, mm-hmm. um, for obvious reasons. My mm-hmm. mom didn't beat the shit out of me. <laughs> Why do we laugh? We're so bad. Like, that's not funny. I know. I know. <laughs> <That's not> funny. <laughs> well, I think it's because we like, like you know, protecting that inner child, yeah, right? It's like true. we're it doing is, a little it is dance. A distractor. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah. I love comedy. I <laughs> think too. comedy can be a, a, a salve or a band aid, right? Like. We're sticking with the dojo yeah. story. I know we can go yes, to comedy, yeah. but I, I want right, to, I really right. want to hear that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, yeah. go, go, dojo. So my, yeah, dojo, go, go, dojo. Yeah. Uh, uh, when, when my uh, teacher, when my mom died, my, my teacher came to me and he's like, I know you're angry. I know, I know you're, you're mad. You're not mad at God. You, you're mad at death. Okay. And he was, I was like, okay, sure. Yeah. How old yeah. were you? Uh, uh, she died in um, 2009. Mm. So. I was in my thirties. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, and then, um, but he said something that stuck with me that I actually, I often offer to, to people when they're grieving their losses too, is like, this isn't something you necessarily heal from, but you do grow around it. You know what I mean? Wow. And I love that image of growing around it because that's what I think how we heal from trauma mm-hmm. is we actually, it's, it's a wound that's going to always be there. But you learn to grow around it and, and you know, you you can use it. You can use your experiences to find your power. You know, it could be fuel for you to do to do better, to be that alchemist, you know. So you need so a, a lot of like the hero's journey. Um, I think of Harry Potter and I think of uh, um, uh, Star Wars. They're very similar stories, you mm-hmm. know. You know, something, you know, this dude that has his power, you know, he doesn't realize it, though. And he he goes through this real hard traumatic thing. And then, like, he has to face the Dark Lord at the end. And then he's like, he's he's like a more whole person. Does that mean he's healed? No. 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 Mm -mm. (laughs) But it means he's grown, Mm -hmm. though. Right. It means he's better than he was yesterday. And and if I compare myself to anyone, it's it's it which I, I hesitate to do these days. Um, it's usually to a former version of myself. I'm like, okay, I'm doing better. And I don't have to. I'm not putting any of that pressure on myself either to be better than I was. I'm just enjoying the process of, of evolving and growing, you know. And I think if there's joy there, then that's what I want to pursue, you know. You just brought up a very important point when we approach healing from, I got to fix this, I need to fix this, especially when there's like this fine line when people want to heal their money shit. And obviously there, there are, there could be very likely financial struggles, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when we approach a healing journey, whether it's money, whatever it is, like we're healing emotional trauma, we're doing this thing, but we're doing it from, I don't really want to change myself. I just want to understand myself and accept myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That has a completely different um, impact on yeah. the the outcome than when we're trying to heal with the ulterior motive of getting rid of something. Right. And I did that for so long, too, and it doesn't work. (laughs) Me too. And the only reason why I can see it is because I had it as well, where I just want to tackle my whatever so that I can make more money and feel better. Yeah. Right? Like, we all want to make more money and feel better. better, Right. Right? Oh, yeah. But Absolutely. When we're doing it with that ulterior motive of, I just want to just get it done with so that I can 
that yeah. really somehow makes things a little bit more sluggish in your system, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you're, you're kicking the can down the road too. He's like, I will feel better when mm-hmm. I have this or this or that amount of money. And then you get to that point and then it, then the, the same thought arises. Well, now I will feel better when, when I get this other thing. I will feel better when I will feel better if. And if, there's no if or when. Because if yeah. we zoom in, right, like yeah. trauma happens when we are not, when we don't receive, yeah. um, you know, unconditional love, when we receive right. conditional love, when we're like, okay, we got good grades. I did the chores. I cleaned after my sister. I did the laundry. That's when I receive positive reinforcement. Otherwise, it's just very negative. What right. we're actually doing, we're just unconsciously redoing that cycle with ourselves. I will love myself when I make more money. Right. I will love myself when uh, I, na, 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 right? Uh, yeah, na, na, na. no, you're right. That mm-hmm. is That just connected some dots for me. That's great. Yeah, because you can't turn that on yourself. The goal of loving yourself can be the thing you kick down the road. Exactly. If yeah. I am this way, then I will be worthy. Of and my then, love, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, man, right, it's it's it's, yeah. uh, it's yeah. like a dog chasing his tail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much, we're not getting anywhere, but no. we need to break that cycle. And sometimes right. we can't see that cycle in ourselves. See, I just pointed that out for you, and yes. I hope for our listeners as well. Maybe yeah. we we did the same. We just broke a cycle in in yeah. in somebody's like merry go round, right? Yeah, I like, hope so. Yeah. I call it a hamster wheel, but yeah, yeah, a merry-go-round. Same thing. It just doesn't go anywhere. Just and you're just like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing it right. I'm doing it. I might yeah. add the video yeah. of this because your yeah. expressions are hilarious. <laughs> Do so it, good. do it. Yeah, yeah. So good. Um, I also want to, I think, all right, I'm going to just go a little bit on a tangent and ask okay. you. It's a little bit like, out there, but what is your perspective on life purpose? Life purpose. Uh, you know, I, I asked myself that question a lot over the years and I was raised mm-hmm. religious and then, uh, got into aliens and all that kind of stuff as we kind of touched on a little bit. Um, Just a little. And I think ultimately like, and I used to, you know, I used to hate the idea that life is meaningless and all this stuff, you know? Um, but you know, I think, and and I can go into a big tangent with this. Uh, Do actually um, go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I believe that we aren't um, human beings. Ultimately, I think we're conscious awareness, and then we're all one. Mm-hmm. And I and I think that. Um, and I'm going to use three dimensional words, which is all I got to explain multi dimensional concepts, I guess. Um, but I I think. That our purpose is to experience life and to, and by, by these life experiences, we carve, uh, our souls in, into who they're meant to be over the span of eternity. And we keep doing this over and over again. And we live all these lifetimes. I'll tell you a dream I had. Mm-hmm. I, okay. Here's a dream I had. Um, my, one, when my mom, shortly after my mom died, uh, she came to me in a dream and she said, come on, I'm going to show you where I am now. And immediately I was like, in my dream, I was like, I knew I had to leave my body to do it. And I was like, anxiety in my dream popped up. And I was like, I can't, mom, I can't. No, 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 no. And she was like, oh, okay. And then she left. And then I woke up and I was like, I, I missed out on my opportunity to to go see where my mom mom is. And so a few weeks went by, maybe a month after that. And then um, I was camping with my family. And then in the middle of the night, I just knew I was like taken out of my body and I'm going to classify it as a dream because I don't have any other words for it. Maybe a vision, a spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. A spiritual experience is a good way to put it. Yeah. But uh, it was in a form of a dream. And so I was taken out of my body and I was super scared because I knew I was out of my body. I was taken up into the, into the sky or the cosmos. And then I, I met this dude, there's this dude next to me and I looked at him and I'm like, are you an angel or are you an alien? He was like, this isn't about, who I am. This is about who you are. And immediately, as soon as he said that this, all the fear left me and this peace just washed over me. Like you hear near near death experiencers talking about this peace and this unconditional love they feel from this entity, you know? So I felt that. And then he pointed me over to this table where where there was a book on the table. And he's like, look at that book over there. And I walk over to it and I start, like I opened it and I start thumbing through the pages. And he's like, each page there is a lifetime that you've lived. 
And he's like, why are you so worried about death? You're like this, like you've lived all of these lives. Why are you worried about death? And he pointed me to, and granted, mind you, I can, I could see like all the way around me, like 360 degrees. Like it wasn't like my, you know, 120 degree vision that I have now or whatever it is like normal human vision, but I could see 360 degrees around me and I was hovering, I was floating over this forested area and he was like, look at that over there. And I could see a sunset, you know, and he's like, a sunset is nothing more but a sunrise somewhere else, (gasps) you know? And then it was, it was amazing. I don't know. He was, he didn't, I wasn't allowed to like, remember any of the lifetimes I had lived. Like I, in my memory, they're all blank pages, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Right. But then like I came back and I woke up and I was back in the campground and I was like, holy shit, it was dark. I could hear the crickets. I still remember it to this day. And like, I walked around with this sense of peace for like three weeks afterwards. And when I tell this story, uh, that's that I, uh, that peace comes back. And so I think our purpose here is, um, to, to evolve. I mean, if we look at what life does on a physical level, that's what it's doing. Life as a whole is evolving. Mm -hmm. And so on a soul level, I think it mirrors that, you know, that we are, we, and it may seem paradoxical, but I think that's where truth really lies is the fact that we are individuals and we are one thing at, at the same time, you know? And yeah. so we get to, ha- we're, we're basically uh, the universe having an experience of being James Kerr or being Nadine, you know, at the same time, you know? Um, and at the same time, we get to put our own meaning on, and our own purpose on top of it too. And now there may be, you know, something that we pre-plan before we're born mm-hmm. that happens, you know, mm-hmm. uh, well, I need to experience this. I need to experience child abuse. I need to experience like being poor. I need to experience like drug abuse, you know, all of this thing, all these things that maybe I signed up for it. You know, people say I didn't sign up for this. Well, maybe, yeah. maybe not. I yeah. mean, there's a lot of spiritual teachings that say, we choose the path that we are, you know, that we're on in in this lifetime because everything has, is adding to the whole experience. It's adding to our soul's growth. And there is, um, there's a a book that I really like that I highly recommend to you, James, and um, to many people out there. It's written in the eighties, but it's so good. It's called bringers of the dawn by Barbara. I believe her name is Barbara, Barbara Marciniak. And it okay. is a, um, it's a channeled book from the oh, yeah. and okay. it's pretty epic because I don't know, like some parts of it, I'm like, how is this legal? Like, this is yeah. just so, <laughs> wow, yeah. it's really out there. But yeah. one of the things that they talk about is like, when our soul comes, it kind of experiences what it's like to be a human. So mm-hmm. that later on, when our soul becomes a spirit guide to a human, it knows or and, and to other life forms, it right. knows what that you know, their mentee is actually going through. Yeah. In my head, I was like, you just want to try burgers. That's why we reincarnate. (laughs) (laughs) I am all about it, dude. Oh, yeah. So that's why we incarnate. I love channeled material. I like, I follow Bashar too on YouTube Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and stuff too. And he's got uh, some, and it doesn't matter to me whether or not I believe it's like real or not. It doesn't matter. Like the message is there. The message is Uh, there. I I channel a lot. A lot of uh, some of a lot of my earlier podcast episodes are channeled material, and sometimes you channel. Yeah. Oh, okay. So now I know someone who channels. Oh my god, that's amazing. Okay. Apparently, I've been doing it my whole life. I just didn't have it. Didn't have a name. (laughs) That's what I. That's what I hear. Like we all do it. Like maybe I feel like I'm channeling my art. You know what I mean? I feel like, mm-hmm. like, like the music. There's a that they call it the muse, right? Like something's coming through, and I'm just a frequency through which it comes through. You know? Yeah. No. Yeah. Not just I. I am a frequency through which that creativity comes through. Good. So I love it. Good. Good, yeah. good modification there. Thank you. Yeah. I'm. <laughs> I'm just little old me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you don't have that. You're so humble. And you're always like, I just get this like vibe of I'm a student of life forever for all yeah, of you. Yeah. And yeah, I, yeah. I don't know anything. And I know like you're not a know-it-all, but you're not yeah. like you're very wise, but you never Thank assume you. that you know things. No, I think 
I, I don't know what I don't know. And I know mm-hmm. that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he doesn't know what he doesn't know. And he knows that. Yeah. Why not? All right. <laughs> um, so I'm, gr- I'm glad that I listened to my intuition and went into the life purpose stuff because yeah. it is definitely something that I think about a lot. And for Same. me personally, um, I still wonder what that was, but I definitely had some kind of guidance. I remember I was in the thick of it in my bedroom as a child and I was like, what's the way out? Because I can't, I can't do this anymore. It's just too much for me. And I would look at the window and at the time, because we were living on the, um, you know, at the lower floor, we had the, um, you know, the security kind of like iron kind of thing. And it's yeah. just like, I can't escape that, that there, but right. it's not what I want. I don't know what to do. And I remember feeling this is okay because you are going to be helping people that are now going through the same thing later on. This has a purpose. That was, I had a similar sense growing you up. Too? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I often wonder, I, I don't know, was was this a coping? Like it definitely helped me survive. Like that was sometimes the only reason why I would keep going. But I wonder whether it's like my body saying, it's okay, you're going to be fine. Like there's a reason or was this like this knowing? And I don't think it matters in the end. Now no, that I'm no. saying it out loud, right. I think what matters is that I survived and I am alchemizing my pain right. into something that serves others. But I don't want to like, I really want to put like an asterisk here and say that sometimes as people who are going through a healing journey, we might default into overgiving. And when we talk about life purpose, we might fall into this notion of like, oh, I got to serve. Yeah. But what happens is that we become depleted. Right. If we're doing that all the time, we deplete ourselves and then we expect our life purpose, our clients, our art, money, whatever it is to fill that void Right. because we're depleted because we're overgiving. And one of the things I believe is that we really need to take care of ourselves before we take care of others. And Absolutely. that is not selfish. Right. I don't think so. I I think uh, uh, even in the Christian tradition, like I don't, uh, like growing up, I, re- I thought about this earlier today, like when Jesus would tell his disciples, take or I don't forget who he was talking to. Someone was judging someone else, right, <laughs> basically. And uh, as usual... <laughs> <laughs> but he's like, take the sty out of your own, your own eye before, or take the log out of your eye before you go trying to take the sty out of this guy's eye, you know? And a similar metaphor would be, you know, when you're on an airplane and the emer- you're, an emergency happens, what do you ask to do? Put the oxygen mask on yourself first, first before you yeah. go and help your 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 kid or your, you know, what, whoever's next to you, right? Like that, yeah. you, otherwise, if you can't, if you're not helping yourself, then you go through and I've been through it myself, compassion fatigue, and then you're just out of resources. And I've had to tell my clients that before. I like, look, man, I can't because I do help I've been one of those people that help people un, untrained as I was, uh, through their traumatic stuff as a tattoo artist. We're a lot like bartenders and therapists mm-hmm. sometimes. You hairdressers, know? yeah. Hairdressers, yeah. <laughs> um so uh, you know, I just this guy was pouring laying it on me, you know, and I was not my nervous system was not prepared because I was already on high alert from all this other shit I was dealing with. And um, so I had to just tell him, I'm, 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 you know, proud of myself for being like putting up a boundary and sticking to it with him. Uh, like, look, man, I'm all out of compassion, bro. I have so much shit I'm dealing with. Wow. I, I can't deal with your stuff right now, man. And he respected it and was like, thanks for telling me, <laughs> you know. And that was like, typically I would have an anxiety attack about like just even being authentic in that way to do, to protect my boundaries. But I was so exhausted that I didn't give a shit. (laughs) Sometimes exhaustion is good for that. (laughs) (laughs) I got too tired to care. (laughs) Go get fucked, dude. Oh man. Um, I wanted to 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 like just zoom into what you just said. Yeah. What would you tell the the if someone is listening to this um and they they do recognize that they have that 
um, starving artist kind of money mentality. And they do struggle with like putting a boundary with a client. And let's just say that that's, you know, a past version of you. What would you yeah. tell that past version of you or to whoever is perhaps wondering what to do about this? Oh, what do you do about that? Well, you know, something I learned in one of my other courses I took before Ryan's course, a great uh, line that he told me, uh, um, he said, uh, compassion is great, but compassion overextended can be harmful. Mm -hmm. You know, Uh, so so you have and I've told my kid this, too, like you need to be able to turn that compassion inward towards yourself as well. Like the same amount of like care and worry that you have for someone else, you could just scratch the worry altogether, but I'm going to, you know, that like, if I'm conceding to the, the, to the brain of the person that I'm, I'm talking to, I'll acknowledge the worry and then, you know, turn that towards yourself as well. Like you, you are more important or should be more important, at least as important Mm -hmm. as the people you're worried about. You know, and, and one of the things that I realized too, like, say I'm like, if I'm going to price a, a piece of art and I want to price it more than I usually do, like I want to raise my tattoo prices. One of the things I have to remember is that, uh, how people react to it, you know, like people actually don't ever react negatively to any of it. Mm-hmm. They don't like the only thing, the only negative reactions from other people I get when it comes to me raising my prices is in my own head. It's never a thing. It's never been a thing. Right. And it doesn't matter how low you lowball yourself in your prices. Someone out there is going to complain about it. (laughs) I remember how, you know, it doesn't matter. Like if, like I'm a hundred an hour, you know, this was in 2005 up to about a year ago. And I hadn't raised my prices since 2005 when I started in this business. And I finally raised my prices to 200 an hour, essentially. I do, mm-hmm. I categorize it in different, different rates, half day rate, full day rate. Um, but it's, I basically doubled my rates. Um, and I hadn't in, since 2005. Now that's a long fucking time, almost 20 years. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't give myself a raise for 20 years um, because I was worried about losing all of my attachments. Now realizing that when people start telling me you charge too little, do you charge too little? My clients would tell me that. And I'd be like, Oh no, I'm, I do this for free, you know, ha ha ha. Uh, and, and now I'm 50 years old or I will be in May, May, May 12th, 12th. by the way. <laughs> yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, I have to think about retiring. How, how the hell am I going to retire? Traditionally in the tattoo industry, uh, uh, you don't retire until you die. That's the whole mindset. But I've already blown my lower back's disc out three times in the same spot. So the more likely scenario, and for most people, this is why retirement exists, the most likely scenario, what's going to happen is you won't be able to work, but you'll still be alive. So what do you do? We don't get a retirement plan in our, in our, no. in our industry. Mm-mm. So you have to do that yourself. And that's what ultimately I think led me to Ryan's course is I knew I need to figure out a retirement plan. And I already kind of worked on some mindset stuff in uh, the TBM course that I took before that. And so you just kind of think of your prices as your name. So if you tell someone your name and they go, that's not your name, I'd rather your name be Joe. That doesn't make any fucking sense, right? Like, like, so if I'm telling someone my price, like this is my price and they go, no, I'd rather it be something else. Then they're just, they're just denying my name. So if you could think about the way you price your art, the way you think about your name, that might be helpful. And that, that was helpful for me um, in that. And, and to, you know, working on some of the beliefs that we have about ourselves and doing that kind of internal work of, of, of playfully and, and, and with love towards yourself, working on these views, if you can, of how you see yourself and, and, the, and the conversation you're having about yourself in your head and sort of kind of detaching your identity from the way you think you, of your way you think mm-hmm. detaching your identity mm-hmm. from in general and just becoming the observer of the way you think rather than identifying with the way you think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah, like exactly. we do, you know, a yeah. part of me is thinking that there is a part yeah. of me that perhaps thinks that everybody's going to leave me when I or yeah. raise my prices that yeah. kind of like just compartmentalizes that part. And you yeah. look at it with compassion as opposed to, 
ah, you know, I do that. Yeah. Oh my God, I'm such an idiot. Why does this yeah. person, why, you know, what is, why can he do it? And I can't. And we yeah. down, go down the spiral. Yeah. Right. So great. That's exactly right. And, and that leads me to this. Uh, he's a, he's a, uh, I guess he doesn't like being called a spiritual teacher. I forget his name right now off the top of my head, but he, like if that part of me that is scared, I already know who that part of me is. He's the third grade version of myself, right? Mm -hmm. If he came up to me and he would be like, hey, man, uh, I, I, I'm I really scared. I, I want to raise my prices and I don't know if I should because I don't want to lose my friends. I wouldn't be like, ah, get out of here, kid. You know what I mean? <laughs> You're bothering me. Go away. You know, I would be like, no, come here, buddy. And I'd give, I'd become the space for that. So be, that's where that, I think that somatic kind of stuff you do is so important for people to learn about, you know, of just embracing those parts of you and giving them that loving space to, and just feel them and allow them, like you say, you taught me to give that part of you expression. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so all of that has to deal with, with how we heal our money trauma, you know, all of that. Like all that trauma in general, like, cause there's no real separation between your personal life and your business life or your no, job or anything. No, 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 Not no, really. No. Mm -mm. no, we, you know, mm -hmm. so if you could deal with yourself on your, on a personal level and learn to love all those parts that you are, even the parts you don't like, yeah. you know, get to know them, uh, understand, get curious about them. The parts that you don't like, like, for example, for me, the anxiety, I was like, well, what is anxiety trying to do? I started getting curious started asking the question, what is anxiety trying to do for me? And the first answer I came up with was, well, it's trying to keep me alive. And then I was like, oh, yeah, it is trying. So it's a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. It's just an overactive, hyperactive friend of mine that I need to, like, turn towards rather than run away from, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and embrace and say, you know, it's okay. Thank you for being being my danger radar. That's the part I named danger my anxious radar. self. Yeah. Danger radar. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm like, thank you. Um, you, uh, you. I love you and thank you. And um, I don't really need you right now. I know I'm safe. You know, we're safe too, right? You know, and then like, I would hear, no, no, we're not safe, not safe, you know. Uh, but I, I would just sit with that, you mm -hmm. know. And now it's like, okay, it's just kind of waiting in the corner in case it's needed now. You know what I mean? Like, the, mm -hmm. <laughs> so like when I'm driving down the road and I see an oncoming car, I don't get a panic attack now that you know it's gonna i'm gonna get in an oncoming collision now the thought that i'm gonna get in an oncoming coming collision still happens but the uh, emotional reaction attached to that thought no longer triggers got know? it yeah that part yeah. is no longer driving yeah i yeah, mean exactly. it's a pun now but like for yeah. real <laughs> <laughs> totally totally it's true yeah. yeah um i love in um there's a book called no bad parts by richard schwartz oh. I've heard of that. I'm writing Dude, that, that down book too. is okay. so good. I've read All that right. book four times and it since July. I love that book so much. And Great. he talks about parts, right? And yeah. the he is the founder, I think the developer, I would say, of internal family systems, which is essentially parts work. Even I do believe that parts work has been, you know, in our in our in humanity for generations. Yeah. Right. But anyway, so he talks about how every part, once it unburdens, it reverts to its, um, you know, original role. So for me, for example, and you, you know, the older, older sibling syndrome that we yeah. joke about sometimes, right. you know, as older siblings, we are wired to take care of people. Right. So that is in money archetypes. We call that the martyr archetype. Oh, yeah. Right. So right. when, so the martyr archetypes role is pretty much to make sure that everybody is okay. Everybody's okay. And that can mean we are not okay, but as long as everybody's okay, everything's okay. Right. right? So it's that over giving, over extending part. And the problem with that when it comes to finances is we're, you know, overspending our money on other people. And also it's very difficult for us to receive. So what yeah. that means is that in our nervous system, it is ingrained in our nervous system. The way it's shaped is that it's very hard. It's, it, it feels dangerous for us to prioritize ourselves. 
Right. So when someone comes to me with a very high martyr archetype and they know that taking care of their finances is an act of self-care, I know that we are pushing against that kind of resistance of it is, but it's not, you know, this unconscious, but it's not safe for me to take care of myself. I got to take care of others. Mm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. So when we start working on that part and giving that part voice and seeing what that part story is and going into the roots and where did it come from? How old is it? What what somatic experience does that part have? Right. What 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 is how does it experience life? And then we create this like, you know, secure attachment for that part. Yeah that part slowly begins to unburden. It begins to release the trauma. And what happens when that, so that we're not like making that part disappear. That part is still there. Right. It's just in its unburdened version, it becomes the caring part of you. The part of you that takes care of you because in essence, that part's role is to care. But when we remove the trauma from it, that's when it becomes safe for us to take care of ourselves. Right. Dude, yeah. That's that's amazing. Yeah. And it, then we integrate it. That's right? integration. Yes, yeah, yeah. integration. Right. We receive wow. it. It's there. It can it can talk to us. It's not something that we need to like get rid of or get over or, right. or we don't like say it's holding me back. It has something to say. Right? right? You know, what does it have to say? Is it valid? If it's not valid, it's like, okay, child blabber. It's fine. Cute. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, if totally. it's valid, <laughs> they don't get to act like they don't act, get to act on the thing, like the, the issue on hand. They get to give their um, opinion on it. Right. But it's from our, you know, self, like self leadership is yeah. that it's not about, Oh my God, I'm powerful. It's really right. about being so compassionate with your parts that your parts trust you enough to yeah. do the job that they were doing be- because of, you know, being very responsible when we were children. Right. Oh yeah. 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 Being the protectors of our younger siblings. Yeah, being, exactly. Uh, partially f- providers for them mm-hmm. too like yeah. yeah and then kind of like learning to ignore our needs for the benefit of, of of them a little bit too that was that was one of the kind of the side effects of that i think so now the way I'm I, about it yeah, yeah it's 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 there and just to 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 go back to like we grow around our wounds, right? Oh, like yeah. that yeah, part yeah. of me is still there. And it's something that I always work on. But because I know of my ten- about my tendency, I've structured my programs and the way that I hold space for people and I coach my one-on-ones or my group coaching in a way that um, works around this. Because I know my tendency of maybe you call it compassion fatigue or maybe like overextending that care. And at some point, and I know where that point is, it's at the three week point every month. It it begins like depleting out of me and start caring about others. Even if it's my husband, my dog, whatever, friends, family members and clients. So now I have this boundary with myself of like, I work for three weeks and then I take care of myself for one week. This That's way, awesome. yeah, and I'm really grateful I get to do that. I'm grateful that I have that self awareness and the ability to include that into my like my my life. But during that week, I nurture myself so that then I can give from the overflow. This way, I'm not expecting my clients to feed me emotionally and spiritually, right? Right, exactly. Because no, that's, that's not their job. No, that's your job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's my job. Yeah. We're yeah, we're yeah. all responsible for that. Yeah, right. That's a good metaphor. I love that because then, like, self care can be related to like you know your mother used to feed you when you were a baby, and then as soon as you learn how to hold a spoon, you got to do that shit yourself. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so you're not going to anymore. Like what? Like no, you got to feed yourself, and then you can feed other people. Like yeah. otherwise, you're going to starve to death, and everybody else is going to eat your corpse. <laughs> That was kind of. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. I love yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to talk about safety. Oh, what yeah. is your 
definition of visceral safety on a nervous system level? What does it feel like to you? Um, It feels warm. Mm. If safety feels warm, it feels expansive, like, like a field of myself or my awareness that is like that stretches beyond my physical Mm -hmm. like and it's just warm and it's peaceful Mm -hmm. it's like the warm sun hitting my skin when i when i've been cold and it's just like ah like a lizard on a hot rock you know and that's 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 what i think of when i think of the safety i love that Um, yeah it's connection Mm -hmm. to to everything it's that that um I'm well fed. I am hydrated. I'm content and I'm fulfilled. Yeah. And what is the emotional like signature of safety for you? The emotional signature. That's an emotion word. An emotion word uh, would be would be happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, happy um, Is calm an emotion? <laughs> mm, I think so. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. a state of being, but yeah, it, yeah. you know, I I prefer being peaceful and calm. Yeah. And happy yeah, yeah. rather than just ah all the time because yeah, that's exhausting. Yeah. yeah, happy and like we were talking the other day about joy. Joy is not mm-hmm. sustainable, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Like it's like too frantic of a like a like ah like christmas like kids yeah. on christmas oh my god yeah uh, you know yeah that can become like excitement and for my nervous system excitement and anxiety are kind of the same thing right <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. it doesn't understand it's like, hey it's yeah. a good thing yeah. it's a good thing it's good it's yeah good. It's totally good. <laughs> totally no we're okay we're okay you want this to happen uh, i do oh good uh, uh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that we're joking about this because we both have yeah. like a complete protocol to to deal with this, but we're yeah. like just laughing it's, at it. It's, <laughs> it's man, you know, I, I again I love comedy for that kind of gives that buffer to like mm-hmm. to like be able to explore and express kind of authentically, but in like a joking way. There's that that's another thing. I think that's another art form that does the Definitely. same thing, kind yeah. of back on that. But yeah. But uh, back to safety, yeah. Safety feels warm, like a lizard on a hot rock. Yeah, I love that so <laughs> and, much. And, yeah, calm, peaceful. Yeah, and I think happy is a synonym for me uh, of peace and and calm. So that's what I'm. You know, I'm generally a happy guy. I think now. Yeah, you are. Yeah. You yeah. are. You're a. You're, you have a very um, happy. You know, energy to you. Yeah. Damn it! Am I, happy? Am I a happy person? Do I? Yeah, come you are. As- <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you come across so. as a uh, very happy, very, very loving, and genuinely caring person. I am. Yeah, I am yeah. genuinely caring. Yep. Yeah. Oh, thank nice. you so I, much. Yeah, I'll, hey, I will see cheers. that. Cheers. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Cheers, everyone. Mm-hmm. You're, are you still all here? Yeah, is everyone's everyone still, still here? here. Yeah, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I, I feel I feel like everybody's enjoying this as well. Yeah. So yeah. when you create from that energy of safety, how is that different than creating from an energy of you know not, of, not of, safety? Of stress and, and of sympathetic uh, or dorsal, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um uh so the self critic is off when I'm creating from that place of safety a mm-hmm. lot more, you That's know? And I, yeah. 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 And I've learned how to like, kind of like create my own bubble of safety and like the act of creativity in and of itself was my bubble of safety growing up. You know, I could control a room if I was drawing like, cause I got bullied a lot at school um, too. So like if I was drawing pictures then people would be like, Hey, draw this, draw that. And just be like, pumped that I was able to do it you know and so I could c- kind of control the room around me uh with my art and then when I started playing music it was got even more amplified art is a music pun there <laughs> ah, ah. um uh so it's kind of like cross-wired in my head as far as like creating from a place of safety or from from stress you know mm-hmm. a, a little bit I think that's part of why I, I can be an effective tattoo artist and, and tattoo in multiple environments because I have that ability to kind of shut out 
okay. things while still having a conversation with my client uh-huh. at the same time, you know? Yeah. So I have certain things that my brain still active on and my conscious awareness is still active on like conversations, mm-hmm. the tattoo art first conversations next, everything else goes away. Got it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I've been able to compartmentalize that. And I, that, that comes from the way I, my art and, and I were brought up together. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a weird thing for me to say that it's hard for me to distinguish creating from a place of safety versus from a place of stress. Cause I, uh, growing up in my art, I didn't know the difference. Got you know it. I mean? Yeah. 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 I feel like that's a very good answer. Also, <laughs> um, just to let you know when we are in, when we're connected in our vent, in our ventral vagal circuit, which is like the, the regulated part of our nervous system when our nervous system is not detecting um, threats. So it's in safety. That is when we're actually able to focus on what's in front of us. We're able to carry on and focus in conversations because Mm. our nervous system is not um, focused on outside to protect us from, you know, incoming danger. That makes so much sense. So I've probably been in that that uh, safety state in in green, mm-hmm. in, uh, green in, yeah. in, in green on the top of the ladder mm-hmm. of the, the the polyvagal thing I'm learning about right now. <laughs> it's so, so awesome funny. though. I, it I've is got, very yeah. awesome, isn't it? Um, yeah. So I probably have that that going, and you know, because I know I've had panic attacks in the middle of uh, mm-hmm. a tattoo before, where I've had to stop and I couldn't. Oh, right. Okay. So you, yeah, that makes so much sense. Like I have to just leave for a minute and come back and then try to, I'm seeing it so much more clearer now using the, that framework of polyvagal theory um, that I just barely scratched the surface on. Um, uh, so yeah, then I can calm down and I come back to that place of safety where, I mean, when I was, okay, so that makes more sense now that I'm thinking back to what I just said and going back in my memories, uh, I can see that I felt the safest when I was doing my art. That's when I I was the safest because n- people wouldn't bother me. You know, mm, I, I would mm-hmm. be able to uh, have more control, and plus I could I could control what I was doing. That's where I had control. I could create my own worlds, and I can go into them, and I could like you know make whatever I wanted happen happen through imagery you know got it yeah yeah for me i think my safety bubble now that i never thought of this before but now that we're talking about this my safety bubble was when i was studying Mm. yeah when nadine is studying because she's clever right when nadine's studying don't bother her don't bother nadine when she's studying i have no demands on me when i'm studying i actually get like oh you're such a good girl you're studying right yeah so i became the one that studies okay yep it's very similar to Mm -hmm. to, yeah so my safety came when i was actually buried in a book um and that then became even a bigger reason for me to study was that the only way for me to leave jordan was to get good grades and get accepted at a university abroad because that was the only way that this Arab girl was going to leave her dad's house without being married to a random other Arab. Because, you know, that's how it was yeah. back then. Yeah. Or maybe right. until now. You live in your parents' house, you get married, that's the only way you, you go out unless you get accepted abroad. So that was my way out. So I had to get good grades. And I did get good grades and I think goodness left. It but worked. It worked. Here yeah. I am, three nationalities yeah. later. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anything else you'd like to add, James? I feel like I want to have you on the podcast more and more times. Um, That'd be awesome. But I feel like this is like a really good intro to the stuff that we generally talk about. And I yeah. think that we have really good conversations and our conversations Absolutely. are very healing for, for me and for you. And I bet for that me, they yeah. are probably healing for other people I hope too. So. So. I hope so. I, I think that's a great place to, to pause it for now. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can come back to it. Um, I just want to thank you for having me on here and thank you for, for encouraging me to, to continue on this path too. 
and and you know i think like going uh, one more thing i do have one more thing actually <laughs> go ahead of course i do uh, <laughs> um but uh, we were talking about life purpose and mm-hmm. um my life purpose what became kind of clear to me at, on a practical level um when uh, uh i was like 12 and my mom finally stopped my dad from abusing us she basically threatened to take us if he didn't stop and so he he stopped physically abusing us and it was at that point that I knew when I had a kid that I wasn't that I wasn't going to repeat the same mistakes. And mm-hmm. I had learned from the school counselor about the cycle of abuse. And it was at that point that I was like, OK, my purpose is to not do this, is it not do what, what just happened to me for years, you know. And so now, like I yeah. kind of like my kid's 24. He's moved out. You know, I didn't abuse him. You know, did I yell at him more than I should have at certain points, a few points in his life? Yes. And I'm, you know that could be something we talk about too, how like I had to like really edit myself. And luckily I had a wife who knew better. And so I defaulted to her wisdom because my impulse when he would piss me off would be just to punch him in the face. And I knew that wasn't right, you know, but there was some instinct there. You didn't or know, some, James. You didn't yeah, I know. didn't. My body didn't know. Your body didn't know. And no. you weren't ever modeled yeah. good parenting. How would you no. know? Right, exactly. Um, but I logically, conceptually knew mm-hmm. that, that that wasn't cool. Um, knowing that just yeah. broke that cycle of generational, yeah. you know. Right. That's and admirable. So now my purpose is, it's still a continuation of that same purpose, you know. Um, it is to start a new cycle of of thriving for my for the next generations, you know. And that's what I'm, that's my purpose now. And that's why I'm here and doing this. So, yeah. I'm speechless. This is so beautiful. Hey. Oh, <laughs> stop it, Jane. I'm going to cry. <laughs> that's so sweet. Yeah. I love, yeah. I love hearing that. I, yeah. I feel like we wish that our dads came to that conclusion at some point. Yeah. yeah. I, I Absolutely. You know, and he, my dad couldn't. He 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 was the the first one that pushed the first domino by stopping the the, the physical abuse, and then he started working on himself. But he could only get so yeah, far. I know. He yeah. never reached out for help, and never you know. So he never got. He probably would have been diagnosed with a few things if he had uh, you know yeah. the, the ability to ex- receive. He never he never developed that mm. ability. So. Yeah. Hmm. Um, but you know, he, I do have video of me talking to him. I was doing a documentary with him about our generational trauma and about what happened to me as a kid. And he was willing to talk about that kind of stuff, you know, (laughs) Um, look at you. That's amazing. My dad would just beat me up right now. If I I mentioned that. Yeah, totally. Um, (laughs) Yeah. I am lucky. And I do count that as one of the reasons why I, I have been able to come as far as I have. Um, but uh, so I, but I, he, he passed away before I could complete it, and and you know, but I do have some video footage of of me talking to him over. It was during the pandemic, and I was have him on speakerphone, and I have my camera on me, and just me and him. He's talking about the shit he went through with his dad and stuff, and so I have that footage. I have all of that. So that's that is pretty gold crazy. for you. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Regardless yep. of what you end up doing with it. Yeah. Even if I don't do anything with it, I, that I, is something you yeah. can play for for like parts of you, even or yeah. like replay in your in yeah. your mind. That is just a gift. Yeah, that's a gift. I was watching a movie a couple of days ago called The Glass Castle. Oh, amazing movie! I'm writing that down. Uh, you write that down. <laughs> Woody out of Harrelson, he's amazing oh, in yeah. it. Oh yeah, gosh, yeah. and he, it's a it's about a man that didn't like he loved his his kids, but he was an alcoholic, and it was like it kept going on and on and on. It's a very good movie based on a real story. And the end of the movie, before he dies, he apologizes to his daughter. And oh. I bawled my eyes out. I cried yeah. and I cried and I cried. And it just, for me, felt like I'm never going to get that apology from yeah. my dad first. And second, you know, I can just imagine just by watching that movie that that was me. That was how yeah. like wrapped yeah. I was in the movie. It's like, that is something that I can like m- maybe imagine for myself. Just that. Yeah. That I one day will receive that apology. Yeah. I don't think I ever will, though, and it it hurts. Maybe not in this life, but in 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 the, in the in between. Yeah, you know, maybe maybe, maybe there because I I I I know 
if if what they say is real in near death experiences, which I've done a lot of, I had to be the hospice nurse for my mom, basically, oh, kind of wow. to in, to a certain degree. But I know, um, uh, my dad. If 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 a, how do I say this to be kind of universal about it? Um, he knows now more about what he did and how that affected me than I do at this point, you know? So that's, that's kind of where my head's at with that. Like, if that's true, then he's more aware of it than, than I am. And shit, like, (laughs) you know, if anything that happened in my dream was true, that I've lived all those lives and blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I appreciate the uh, language up to a point, but it kind of fails when it comes to describing like spiritual things, you know, things Mm -hmm. that are beyond our spectrum of being able to experience or understand uh, and categorize. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm the same way, but um, I feel like we all, we all felt it's more of a felt sense. That's the thing. That's the feeling. That's where the, that that's the, the language there is the feeling. Yeah. Of like, he, Whatever. I, well, the chaplain at the hospice when my dad was dying, he told me, well, your dad's identity is expanding. And I love that view of wow. death. Wow, yeah. There's an expansion of our identity. He's becoming everything, you know? Like, either way you look at it, you look at it from a scientific materialistic point of view, that's true. His molecules are everywhere now, you know? Yeah, His they're atoms dispersed are dispersed everywhere. Dispersed everywhere. So there's there's some truth there, however you want to look at it. Yeah. Seriously, you are a freaking gem, and I love oh, talking to you. You too. I love it. This is yeah. this is so freaking good, and I'm so excited to share it with everyone. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, where can people find you? Uh, I'm on uh, Instagram. Actually, you know what? A uh, uh, great place to go would be uh, CaptainKerrArt.com. Oh, okay. That's where all my social media links are. And you can see some pictures of like my tattoo that. work there and some of my extracurricular art. And from there, you can find uh, the band. I'm I'm, uh, I'm not touring with these guys anymore because it's real expensive of working on my money stuff. Oh, right? yes. yeah. are you now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine that. Um, so, uh, but yeah, CaptainKerrArt.com. Okay, I'll link that in the show notes. Okay. Thank Thank you you so much, James. And thank you, everyone, for listening, for sticking around this long. I know this was long, but fuck, it was so good. And (laughs) (laughs) I'll see you all next time. Um, Take care for now.